All right, let's make a start. So basically today we need to finish off a little bit on surfaces and surface integrals. And then we're going to pull together everything we've been doing for the last five weeks into essentially the three key theorems uh, which make life a lot easier when you're dealing with vector fields and things like that. And you might have encountered them already in physics. Someone will say, oh, just use Stokes' theorem. Or, oh, well, we can just use Green's theorem here. Well, now we're going to talk about what those theorems actually are. And you'll see why it is that we, we like them so much. Uh, so, oh, so before I dive straight in, just to give you an update. I am still finishing the grading. I hope I'll have it back by tomorrow. Uh, life happened. Sorry about that. Um, but you will definitely have it back by Wednesday at the very latest. Um, the, mid, the final exam, similar format to the midterm, just covering weeks four, five, and six. Obviously, don't ignore weeks one, two, and three in your studying, because as you've seen, we use all of it as we go along. Uh, so I just want to check how far we get today in case we don't do everything here. I haven't put up today's online quiz. I mean, this week's online quiz, but I will as soon as I know what we covered. Any questions or concerns? All right. Um, is, it, sorry, is, is triple integrals are trainable? Yep. Cool. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, once you can do double integrals, you can do any integrals. I mean, it's just applications of the same thing. It's just a bit hairier. Um, and also improper integrals? Improper integrals. Cool. But we didn't spend a lot of time on them, mm -hmm. so from that you can judge. I might ask a small question, but not a big question. Okay. <coughs> so we've talked about line integrals. Remember, those were things where we had a sum curve and we were integrating either um, a scalar field or a vector field around that curve. But there's no reason why we couldn't also ask questions that, like, for example, what is the integral of z equals root x squared plus y squared over some surface instead of around a curve. It's, it's a perfectly valid thing. And similarly, there's no reason why we can't ask, well, how much of a vector field is going through a particular region rather than just around a curve? And in fact, these kinds of questions come up in physics a lot. So, so what we're doing today is really putting together the machinery in order to be able to do these kinds of integrals. So just to remind you, because the, the process that we're going to do is, is almost exactly the same for surface integrals as for line integrals. So when we were talking about line integrals, remember we were dealing with things like this. You want to integrate this bunny over here, which is a scalar field, along a curve. And the way that we did it was we said, okay, let's parameterize that curve. So we found that curve in terms of some parameter t. And that enabled us to take this thing, which we don't, not very clear what it means, and turn it into a perfectly standard different uh, integral that we could do. Yeah? And similarly, um, so one of the problems that we did said, okay, here we've got a vector field, and we want to integrate it around this line here. Again, we parameterized that line, and that enabled us to take that hairy equation over there and turn it into this quite sweet little single integral. Okay, so the key here was parameterization of the curve. And we basically use the same idea when we're doing surface integrals, except now we want to parameterize the surface instead of the curve. So what we need to talk a little bit about is parameterizing surfaces. So again, just to remind you, parameterizing curves, we said, okay, we take some parameter t, and as t varies, we set up our equations for x and y and z so that as t changes, we move along the curve the way we want it to. But now we want to be able to do that for a surface. And a single parameter isn't going to do it, because a single parameter will move us along a curve. But now we need to be able to move in two dimensions. And the answer to that is we use two parameters. So it's exactly the same idea. Now, instead of having, so over here, we just had a line for our parameter. Now, we're taking as our parameter space some two-dimensional space, which we'll call u and v, just so that we don't think about it as x and y. 
And from each point in here, we get a U and V. And we're going to plug that into our R, which looks like this. And when we plug in our U and V, that will tell us what our X component is, what our Y component is, and what our Z component is. Kind of make sense? So, so it's this, we've just gone from one dimension to two dimensions, but we're doing the same thing. So let's just look at an example. Um, so here we have a surface, uh, A cos u sine v in the x direction, A sine u sine v in the j direction, and A cos v in the k direction, and A is just some constant. And what we want to ask is, what does this surface look like? So I'm not going to, in this course, ask you to just tell me what that surface looks like. I'm going to instead today head straight to GeoGebra and show you how this parameterization works. So there is my surface, and I've just uh, given it, I've just made A equal to 5 so that we could see it clearly. So how are these parameters working? Remember, we have the parameters U and V. Well, you could spend some time sketching this. <coughs> this is the top surface, the, the top half of a sphere. And as I move the parameter u, so that's the angle in my cos of u and my sine of u for my x components, what happens with my u? Well, if I let that, so I've, I've plotted some point p, and let's see how p changes as I let u change. So as I let u change, u is mapping out the kind of the lines of latitude, longitude. I, I always get the names wrong. Okay, so, so, that, so if we just had the u, that would parameterize a curve like so. Um, and if we look at how v changes, stop, stop. Can't make it stop. Ah, we're doomed. <laughs> ah. Okay, let's just. Okay, well that was that was slightly terrifying. Okay, our p has moved a little bit. Okay. Now let's see what happens in the terrifying situation where I push the button for v. V moves me up and down. So you can see that by taking all the possible values of u and all the possible values of v, I'm going to map out all the possible places on that top sphere. So that, that is how we're parameterizing the top part of a sphere. So that's the kinds of things that we're doing. I wonder if it will let me pause. Nope. Okay. That's fine. We'll just go elsewhere. Okay. So you're not <coughs> going to need to do any hectic parameterization. It's going to be very straightforward. But the general idea is exactly the same as parameterization of curves. And remember, we learned with parameterization of curves, it's not unique. Uh, so you pick what works for you. Um, so here, I mean, if I'd asked you to parameterize the surface, the top surface of, of a sphere, you might immediately have said, well, it's going to make sense to move into spherical coordinates in the same way as if I'd asked you to parameterize a circle, you would have probably wanted to go into polar. Um, so, so often there's an, a kind of an obvious way to go to try, but there's no single right answer. All right. So uh, we have to do the usual smoothness disclaimers. We're parameterizing surfaces. We're assuming that our surfaces are nice and well-behaved and smooth. You don't need to worry about these details, just that if you ever find yourself in a situation where your surface is not smooth, so it has like little weird pointy bits or poles or things like that, this won't work. You'll have to do more maths. But for everything we do in this course, things will be smooth. There will be ponies. It'll be great. OK, so. Now that we have this idea that we can parameterize surfaces, what we want to do is figure out how do we integrate over surfaces. And we're going to start by just saying, suppose, so, so ideally we want to answer a question like this. There is some function of x and y, and I want to integrate it over the surface s. We're going to start a little more simply and say, OK, let's just work out what the surface integral is of the surface so in a sense, it's the same as finding out what is the length of a curve from A to B. Here we're finding out what is the area of a surface. So the picture to have in your mind, here is my surface S, and I want to work out 
the surface area. And just like you do in all kinds of calculus, you break it up into small little bits. So we're going to break it up into little, little kind of square things, S1, S2, and if we add them all up, we kind of get the surface-ish. Okay, and as we make them smaller and smaller, we get a better and better approximation. You can see where this is going. I'm not going into more details. Very hand wavily, we let things take the appropriate limits, and we end up with the area of S is this double integral over S of the area element dS. So what we need to do in order to be able to integrate this thing is to actually have some useful thing for dS here. So remember in our when we were doing line integrals, we had a little ds, and we had to turn that into things in terms of dt, and then we could integrate. Well, here, we're going to be turning this into, so this is actually an area element, so it's going to be a du dv kind of thing. So we need to find out what ds is, and then we can do the integral. So let's take a closer look. Here's the little ds that I want to find out. And we're assuming that I've parameterized my surface in terms of u and v. So I've got some curves. Um, if I look at holding u constant, I can have a curve like so at v. And sorry, I'm letting v change, and I've, I'm fixing u naught. So this will give me a curve like so. Now, if I add u naught plus a little du, and letting v vary, I'm getting this second curve here. And I can do the same thing with v0 and v0 plus dv. So I've got an idea of what's happening on the boundaries of my little ds with my parameterization. But that doesn't really help. I mean, at the moment, I still want to know what ds is. But hopefully you remember from, from when you did linear algebra, a very convenient fact that if you have um, two vectors, um, then the curl, the gradient, sorry, the, the curl, the cross product, the gradient, let me start that again. Mm -hmm. Too many words. Okay. The magnitude of the cross product is the area of the parallelogram formed by those two vectors. Ha ha. Okay. So if we have a vector here and a vector here, then we would know ds. But we do have vectors there because we know that our vector here is just um, basically given by the derivative of our r with respect to u because we're changing in the u direction. And over here, our vector is given by essentially dr dv because that tells us we're changing in the v direction. If this is feeling weird, you'll probably need to go back and revise where we're talking about um, derivatives of uh, parameterized curves. We're, we're just doing it in two dimensions now. But the key thing to take out of this is that we can quite straightforwardly get our little ds if we take the cross product of dr du with dr dv and then multiply it by our little du dv. Weird but true. Um, and so, I mean, I, I really hate this notation because this is, remember this, so this is saying this is d, so this whole thing is the split up from the cross product that you get. Um, it's, some, it's dy by du dz dv minus the reverse order uh, dz du, dy, dv, something like that. It's what you get out of the cross product. Yes? Um, so I, I find this much easier to work with because then you've got i, j, k, uh, dx, du, dy, du, dz, du, dx, dv, dx, dy, dv, dz, dv, and then you can work out your cross product from there. 
yes. Um, but whichever way you, you, you feel better about using this. Okay, so this seems like a lot, um, and it is piggybacking off pretty much everything we've done so far. But the key thing to take out of this is that we know how to find tangent vectors of curves. So we take our curve R, where we're holding U fixed and letting B vary, and we take a tangent of that point, and it's going to give us that vector there. And then we do the same thing in this direction, and it's going to give this tangent over here. And then we take our two tangents, and we cross product them in order to get the area of our little ds. That's essentially what we're doing. And once we've got our ds, then basically we're, we're good to go because we can take this integral here and transform it into our integral over a domain that we know about because we've parameterized it, so we know what our domain is, of this thing over here, which we can work out. So we've gone from some integral that we don't really know about to something in terms of parameters. And it might not look very pretty, but it's a straightforward double integral that we can work with. So that sorts out our, our question of how do you find the surface area, um, but we want it to be more general. Well, more generally, if you want to find the integral of some function over ds, so not just ds itself, what do you do? You use the same parameterization for your function that you did for your surface. You include your function over here, and you're good to go. So it's almost exactly the same thing, except now you've got this included in your integral. Okay. So that's the theory. Let's do an example, um, and I think it'll help. So what we'd like to do is evaluate the function z over the conical surface z is equal to x squared plus y squared between z is equal to naught and z is equal to 1. Ah. Okay, so let's, let's do a little bit of sketching here, I think. Uh, so if you want to look at the conical surface, uh, what does it look like? We head into GeoGebra. Well, that was unfortunate. I appear to have just killed my iPad. Okay, well, well, that's finding itself. <coughs> that's better. Okay, so we're looking at the surface z is equal to square root of x squared plus y squared. So we want to integrate this thing between z is equal to 0, so starting out here, and z is equal to 1. So that's the kind of the picture that you want to have in your head. So just to remind you, here's our, here's our cone doing something like that. And there's our z, there's our y, and there's our x. And we know that we want, so our surface is going to be equal to, because we've just worked this out, so I'm just reminding you what, we, what we're trying to calculate here. Oops, let me. Okay, so we want to calculate this thing 
what we're actually going to calculate is this over here. And I should have put in other. Okay. So we need to first, the first thing we need to do is parameterize this surface. So we want to parameterize this thing over here. So I'm going to talk this through using u's and v's, but you'll see at the end that actually we could just think of x and y as our parameters, but I want you to see it in terms <coughs> of the variables that we've used in the discussion so far. So really what I'm just going to do is I'm going to say I'm going to let x equal the parameter u. I'm going to let y equal to the parameter v. And I'm going to let z therefore be, because our z is root x squared plus y squared, so that's going to be u squared plus b squared. Okay, and this is about the simplest parameterization you could ever do. Um, I'm sure you could do fancier things. You could probably do something in polar or spherical or something, but this is going to be enough. So what is this saying? Well, this is saying if I think about my parameterization, so I'm always thinking in terms of my, my r of u and v, which is mapping out all the points on the surface. All the points on the surface are mapped out by this thing here. So basically, if I take my u, take a u and a v, and I plug it into this r thing over here, it will give me a point on the surface that I'm interested in. Okay, so now we go ahead and we can calculate our, our, our tangents. So in the u direction, my tangent looks like this. It's I just taken the derivative, partial derivative with respect to u. So that gives me an i hat plus, so nothing from the y component and from the k component. If you work it out, you'll get well, let's just do it. I've got a half uh, over u squared plus v squared times the derivative of the inside, which is a 2u. That's in the k. And I can, I can cancel those 2s. And the other thing that I can notice is that this thing over here is just z. So actually what I've got for my dr du is i plus u over z in the k. I can do the same thing for my tangent in the v direction. So you can double check this. It's almost exactly the same except the first two terms kind of swap. So I've got naught in the i hat plus j hat plus v over z in the k hat. So I've, you might be saying, but z isn't one of our parameters. I'm just doing this because it's, it looks a little bit neater. You could leave it like that, um, but it, it doesn't really matter. It just this kind of looks a little cleaner. And we can always transfer back to z is u in, in terms of u and v if we need to. OK. And you'll see why in a moment. Um, so now we need, so going back up here, we need to have our, our cross product. So we do our cross product of dr du, dr dv. And I'm not going to bore you with the details. You do this however it makes you happy. But what you'll end up with is Okay, so do your cross product. Okay, so we've done the cross product. Now we have to take the magnitude of the cross product. So 
So the magnitude of our cross product is just the magnitude of this bunny over here. And if you do that, you will get 1 plus u squared over z squared plus v squared over z squared. And if you simplify this, and note that, um, so we've got a, a common z squared over here, so we'll get a u squared plus v squared over z squared, but u squared plus v squared is just z squared, by how we defined up here. So after all that work, <laughs> this is equal to 1, so our thing is equal to 2. And all this is is really kind of a, a scaling factor for your little parallelogram um, that tells you kind of how it's how how that area scales compared with Cartesian coordinates. Um, okay, so okay, so we found our, our magnitude of our cross product. So what has this got us? This has got us to the point where we can convert our ds into into that. Okay, so remember back up here, we wanted to solve this integral, but actually what we need to do is do this thing over here, so we needed to convert ds into this thing over here. Well, we've just done that. Our conversion is root 2 du dv, and so now we just need to put in our f of uv, and we're, we're almost home and dry. Okay, so we've got <coughs> our integral of s of z <coughs> ds is going to be equal to root 2. <coughs> integral of z, well, let's put that in. That's going to be u squared plus v squared times, so I've taken my root 2 out, so I've got du dv. Okay. And the only thing that's left is the question of what are these limits over here? So if we go back to our original question over here, it says we want our limits to be between z is equal to naught and z is equal to 1. And we know that our z is equal to root x squared plus y squared. So for our limits over here, we need So what does that tell us about u and v? Well, this tells us that naught has to be less than or equal to square root of u squared plus v squared, which has to be less than or equal to 1. So what we're integrating over here is really the region. So our region here, our region r, is the region u squared plus v squared is less than or equal to 1, where all I've done is say, OK, I don't really want to deal with this root, but I can I can take the square of this whole thing, and then that just tells me I need to have u squared plus v squared has to be less than or equal to 1. So here, for example, that is being more convenient to put your product coordinates, so actually behave. So that's exactly what we're about to do. We're going to go, I don't want to do that. Um, let me go to polar coordinates. That will make my life much better. Um, so we're going to change to polar. Okay, so remember, polar coordinates du, dv, you're used to thinking of it as dx, dy, but it doesn't matter. Changes to r, dr, d theta. And if we make that change, then our z, which is equal to u squared plus v squared, will be equal to just r. OK, we're nearly there. Just keep going. So this whole thing actually is just equal to, so here's my root 2. Don't forget about that. And it's my integral of r. So this is my z. And then times r dr d theta. So that's gone there. This is from there. And polar coordinates you can check. So I'm integrating r from 0 to 1, because that's my z. And I want to go the whole way around, so I'm going from 0 to 2 pi. 
So finally, my integral looks like this. And if you spend a little bit of time, I mean, this is not a tough one to do, so we do r first and then theta, but you will find out that you get that. Yeah. Could it also have just changed to polar directly the beginning? Uh, sure. You could have parameterized like that. Okay. Um. Okay. So the key things here were the same steps that we, we did when we were thinking about line integrals. The first one is to parameterize, and then you find the, deriv the appropriate derivatives of your parameterized curve to give you a way of, turn of converting your integral from your little ds to du dv. So we did that over here. Um, so we converted this to this by parameterizing. And then we needed to find some limits of integration over here, which we did by looking at our region. Um, and then we did another conversion because we looked at our region and like, we don't want to have to integrate that. We can do it by polar. And so we finished up. Yeah. Depending on the region, you might be able to get a lot of different limits. Uh huh. So any limits work so long as it's OK with the region. I mean, so I mean, your limits are determined by your parameterization. Um, so, so you work with your parameterization to say, okay, what are the limits of my parameters that I need in order to get exactly the surface that I want? Um, but you might have different ways of doing it. We've seen that with curves as well, so it'll be the same here. I mean, the for me the there's a two-edged sword. On the one hand, parameterization is great because there are infinitely many parameterizations. Um, so you pick one that works for you. Um, on the other hand, parameterization is terrible because there's no clear-cut, straight, correct answer. Sorry. Welcome to life. It's kind of the same. Um, okay. So this gives you a basic feel for how we do these. Now notice that we could have really avoided this whole U and V thing by just diving straight in and saying, okay, my parameters are my parameters are x and y. I could have kept my x and y here and done the whole thing without u's and v's, which are confusing. But I wanted you to have seen the full working because sometimes your parameterization won't be as straightforward as this. But often it will be, particularly in this course. So in general, if our surface is parameterized by x and y, then so I think I need to write this as, uh, okay, so what do I mean by surface is parameterized by x and y? So this really means that your z is equal to some g of x, y, rather than g, is g of u, v. Then, in fact, you can have, and you saw, we saw this in the equation that we had. Now here, uh, this is g with the the derivative of g with respect to x, in this case, and y here. So these subscripts are referring to partial derivatives. Okay, so we actually saw that um, coming up over here. Uh, there is our 1 plus partial with respect to, in this case, x or u, all squared, and partial with respect to v or y, all squared. Okay, so we've, we've kind of already seen an example of how this works. Uh, so that can be quite a useful simplification. And this talks through, in general, if you want to, it, this just does the, what we just did in general. Um, we did the specific case over there. So you can have a look at that. Okay. How are we doing? Okay, I will... Uh, you've seen it before. It's the derivative of g with the partial derivative of g with respect to x. So it's derivative of z with yeah. respect yeah. for x. And yeah. Why do we have that over here? Yeah. 
Okay, so that's integrating scalar fields over a surface. So the next thing we'd like to be able to do is integrate vector fields over a surface. But in order to be able to do that, we need to talk a little bit about uh, surface orientation, because now suddenly um, we're not just having some scalar field, a vector field kind of has directions involved. So you're going to want to know, like, is the vector field coming out of the surface or going into the surface? So we need to be able to talk about um, some, some way of orienting what we're talking about. So a surface is called orientable if, and there are, there are different ways of thinking about it. Um, the one of the easiest ways is to think if you take a 2D image on the surface, you can't move it around the surface and back to where it started so that it looks like its own mirror image. Okay, what crazy thing do I have in mind here? So here's a Mobius strip. If I take my image of a crab, then once it goes one complete way around, the crab is flipped because of the way the, the surface works. The crab has to go twice round to get back to how it was. What is the problem here? There's the problem essentially with a Mobius strip is I can't tell you an inside and an outside of the strip. If you imagine that I just had, so I had a not Mobius thing here, I can clearly define an inside and an outside. If I put the crab on the outside, it just keeps going round, and I could say that this is the outside and that's the inside. But there's no inside and outside for a Mobius strip. So what we want to avoid is dealing with surfaces like that. So that's essentially what we're talking about when we're talking about orientability, is we want surfaces where we can say there's an inside and there's an outside. So basically anything normal. Anything normal. Okay. And in fact, anything for which we can put a normal vector. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's really what this bit is saying over here, is we can pick a direction that is out or normal or up on our surface. And it will become a lot more clear as we look at examples. So obviously, if you pick a direction, um, you could say, well, this is up, or you could say, this is up. That's the, that's the thing you pick. You can pick the direction. So we have a convention. And the convention says that, OK, if you have your surface that is orientable, um, which way do you pick the normal? Well, you go around the boundary in an anti-clockwise direction, and we use the right-hand rule, then the normal will point up. So if your fingers point in the direction that the boundary goes, your thumb will tell you where the normal is. The other way to think about it is if you walk around the boundary like this, so you walk around the boundary with keeping the whole surface on your left, then you are walking on the top. Okay or you are walking on the, in the direction that the normal will point. So it gets a little bit weird if you've got a, a boundary over here. Now we're walking, keeping the boundary on our left. We're going in this direction that will orientate that curve there, and the normal will go up like that for both. OK, we'll, we'll see some examples. Sorry. Yeah. I didn't quite get what you meant with the little circle in the hole. So, so the key thing that I'm just saying at the moment is keep the boundary on your left. I mean, sorry, keep the region on your left when you're walking around the boundary. And that will give you the direction of the curve that you're interested in, the, the orientation for your boundary. So, so when, when we walk here, we keep it on the left and we get going this direction. Mm -hmm. But if you keep the boundary on your left while you're walking around here, then you have to be walking the other direction because the boundary is kind of on the outside. I wouldn't in that sense if we give a right hand rule then the direction would vary. No. Uh. Yes, because if you apply the right hand rule, you get the, <coughs> you get the normal of the surface you're walking around to. So in the circle, you get a normal yes. down. But the normal so, so the so the right hand rule here, I mean, you've got to be a bit careful. If you if you walk around in this direction with the right hand rule, but that's for this inside bit, yeah. would be down. But for outside, it's up. OK. And you can read a little bit about this. We're not going to worry about piecewise smooth. It's basically just saying, if you're building up a surface from lots of little bits, how can you ensure that it's orientable? 
that's how you do it. Okay, so flux integrals. So the whole point is that we want to know how is our flux pointing relative to our surface. So I've got some flux maybe doing this, and I've got some surface here. I orient my surface so that it has a normal, and then I can see is my flux basically pointing in the same direction, or maybe it's pointing in the opposite direction. So that's the kind of thing we want to know. So we're wanting to be able to answer questions like how much flux is going out of a surface. And in order to do that, you need to define what out of surface means and how that relates to the direction of the flux. But a lot of what we're going to do is quite similar to what we've already done. So if our S, so again, we parameterize our curve surface. That's, that's going to be the first step always. Then we can find a normal vector. We know how to find normal vectors to surfaces. We've been doing that for weeks now. And we use the same, so notice here, our ds, here is our cross product. We've just worked out here. So our ds is the same. Um, but we need to have a vector element here, because what we're trying to work out here, we want to work out our f dot ds. So it's a dot ds. So this we're treating as a vector, not just a little scalar thing now. So we need a direction for that. And we take the direction for that in order to have the, the correct orientation for S that we want. So are we wanting to consider S as going up or going down? It's going to make more sense when you look at an example. But the key thing here is this is the integral we're trying to solve here. How much of the flux is going through the surface? Um, we're converting this ds into something that looks very familiar except now this is a vector, it's not, we don't have the magnitude here, we've got the vector over here. Um, this is again the version with the mixed partials. Okay, so let's, let's look at an example. So the kind of thing we're trying to solve is we've got some vector field, which looks like z in the x component and x squared in the z <coughs> component, and we want to find out how much of that flux is upward through this surface which lies above that square. Okay, so that all sounds a little bit hairy, but let's look at the picture. So we've got a square that we've defined. Maybe it's easier if I make this. And there is a part of the surface, if I move this up like so, So this square down here, if you project it upwards, maps out kind of a boundary on my cup. And what I want to know is within this mapped out bit of my cup, how much of that vector field is passing through it. That is essentially what I'm asking. OK, so let's do the calculation. Okay, so they are written here. So the first thing is parameterize our surface. And this is a situation where our x and y are perfectly good parameters. Um, there's no there's nothing particularly, I mean, we could potentially, I guess, go to polar or something, but x and y will be fine. Um, so let's use... Okay, so then what we have? Well, we have our parameterized surface. squared plus y squared. Okay, so that's my parameterized surface. And what's good about this is we already know our limits for x and y. So, so a hint for our parameterization actually came 
from this bit over here because we know Okay, so we've got our parameterized surface, we take its partials. And I'm going to just dive straight in. I'm going to use this notation because it's a lot quicker. Okay, you can check those. And we work out our cross product. And I, why have I just gone into using these? Sorry. Okay, so I've got most of the things that I need and I just want to write out my F explicitly. So remember my F is Z in the X component and X squared in the Z component. So it's going to look like So the thing that we haven't really had to do before is we need to pick. Can you explain why f is like this? Because our f is equal to z in the i hat plus zero in the j hat. Yep. Yep. Okay. So pick. So this thing that we calculated over here is a normal. It is either, so remember when we're calculating normals for surfaces, we can always calculate two normals. So the other normal would be the normal 2x, 2y, minus 1. And now what we need to do is pick which of the two is correct. Well, it says here that we want the part, so we want the flux going upward through that part of the surface. So we want up to be the direction of our normal, because then if it turns out that our flux is going entirely downwards, we should get a negative value, as in flux is not going upward, it's going downward. So we want up to be the direction of our normal. So up means we want z to be positive. So in fact, this normal will do fine, because our z component is positive. But if the question had instead asked, what is the flux going downward through the surface, then you would want the other normal, which would be pointing downward. Okay, so we want, we want up. So this normal will do fine. Okay, so now the next step is we calculate our f dot n. Okay, you can plug that in. And this finally lets us plug everything back into the original equation. So if you head back to what we've done so far is we've calculated 
this thing over here. So that we can now go from this integral over here, which we couldn't do, to this integral here, and we even know our limits over there. So that's that's all we're we're doing. Okay, so the final step, our integral. Plug everything in. And our limits are the ones that we've found. Uh, I think they should actually be. Um, in the formula, it says plus minus. Is that taking into consideration by the normal already? Uh, so. That is a plus. Okay, so you need to read the full sentence here where the sign is chosen to reflect the desired orientation. So we picked, so you find a normal, yeah. and then your ds is that normal, and then you have to pick this, we pick that. Okay. and we picked that when we said, actually the one we found is fine. Okay. So, that's the right so we, we calculated a normal, and then over here we said, okay, we want a normal that points up, because it's asking us to find the flux up through the surface, and for up, we need our Z component to be positive. So we, we did the picking. Cool. Yeah. And if you finish that up, you should get. Yes, sorry, I did the original in U's and V's. Okay, <coughs> so there is a lot going on with these problems, and the only solution I have for you is to practice doing a bunch of them. But the key idea to get kind of comfortable with, and this is why I've tried to divide things up into steps, is the steps are pretty much always the same. Parameterize. Find your partial derivatives, and find the conversion to go from ds to d u d v or d x d y um, so this is kind of this bit over here. so there is sort of converting into your parameterized things find whatever you're going to have over here so instead of having f dot ds you're going to have something over here which you do like so and then you go straight forward and do your double integrals so it's a very similar process to finding um, line integrals it's just now we end up with double integrals. Okay. So kind of build up a process for yourselves. Um, it's, it's kind of got to be an internal thing. But these are guideline steps. Okay. So there are shortcuts. So just like in the for the surface integral of the scalar field, we had a, f a formula that helps. Um, you can read about this. If this helps you, that's fine. I pretty much always just go back to basics because I struggle to remember things like this, but you can read this if, you're, if, you're, if you want to. Okay. So we now have to pull everything we've done together into um, kind of something that looks like the fundamental theorem of calculus. So if you remember, sorry, um, if you think back to when you were studying first cal calculus, you learned about derivatives, and that was a thing, and then you learned about integrals, and that was a thing, and then they got combined together into two parts of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which linked how do derivatives and integrals get linked. Uh, so here, this is talking about, um, so you've got f is differentiable and its derivative is f, then you have a link between the two like so. And in part two, again, you have another way of linking. So the question you might ask, because you'll notice that basically what we've done is all, all we've been doing is the 
kind of the calculus of various kinds of vector functions. So now we've done a whole bunch of derivatives. We did all the partial derivative stuff and we did like gradients. And then we've been doing a whole bunch of integration. So we've been doing surface integrals and line integrals and all those things. So we've got all the derivative stuff and we've got all the integral stuff. And the question you might ask is, is there something like the fundamental theorem of calculus that links the two? And the answer is lots of things, <laughs> okay? Because now we've got many different vari kind of variations on things. Um, so, so the last bit that we're looking at is how can we link the two? And remember, it's the fundamental theorem of calculus that makes life much easier often when you're integrating. If you didn't have the fundamental theorem of calculus, um, you'd be a bit screwed. So hopefully, the theorems that we get for the rest of today are going to make life easier in some situations. We have different answers for 2 and 3D, and in some cases we have multiple answers. Um, we're just going to talk about a few. So we already know how to talk about rates of change for scalar fields, but we also need to be able to talk a little bit about rates of change for vector fields. I mean, we know how to take partial derivatives, but let's see what happens. So just to remind you, for a scalar field, we came up with this idea of the gradient. So we apply our nabla or our del to our scalar field, and we get our gradient. And we know that our gradient tells us the direction of greatest increase of f. So if your surface was something like this, and you found your gradient, it was a little vector on the xy plane that said, if you go in that direction, that's the way to get the fastest increase on your surface. Yep? OK. And in fact, if we take the magnitude of our gradient, that tells us the rate of change in that direction. So that tells you, if you go in that direction, that's how fast your function is changing. So that's great. OK? We, we're, we're good with talking about derivatives, derivatives or rates of change of scalar functions. But we haven't actually talked about vector fields. So for a vector field, which is one of these bunnies, if you take all the partial derivatives, there are nine of them. And that's a lot of partial derivatives to try and kind of build a single useful concept. So there's nothing quite like the gradient that we can construct for vector fields. We can't get all the information from these nine partial derivatives into a useful single thing. Instead, we have two, two things that we use that tell us different things about the how the vector field changes. Um, so we have what's called the divergence, usually shown as div f. And that is, we're using our nabla again, but we're taking nabla dot f. So we're constructing a scalar by taking, so our vector field looks like this. Our vector field is looking, what is happening here? Not sure what's happened. My okay, let's just step out. Okay, yeah. Yes, it's an Apple Pencil. Well done. Ah, we're out of battery. Okay, that's that's unfortunate. Okay, let me charge it for a little bit. Okay. So we have these two ideas, the divergence, and we have the curl. So the divergence we get by taking the dot product of our del operator, our nabla operator with our, our function, and the curl we get by taking the cross product. And it's not immediately clear why we would do this, but it turns out that these are the two useful things to do. So let's just take a moment while my poor little pencil charges to work out, so here's a vector field. Please work out the divergence and the curl for it. So there are, there are your formulae.
so you won't generally end up writing things out in excruciating detail, but let's just do it to be absolutely clear. So we're treating this thing like an operator here, and we're saying we want to dot this thing with that thing. So this is what we've got. And now we perform the dot product. So the dot product says take this times that, or rather apply this to that. So we get d by dx of xy plus d by dy of y squared minus z squared plus d by dz of yz. And then you just do your, your partials. Okay, so when we take the partial with respect to x, our y is treated like a constant, so that's just going to be y plus 2y plus y. Did I do that right? Yep, amazing. Okay, and then we do the same idea for working out the cross product. Um, so it's nicely worked out over there for you. It's just always a bit more of a pain working with a cross product. Um, but we've got double cross F. Okay, so it's going to be the derivative with respect to y of our x component, of our z component, so that's going to be in our i hat direction so you can see these things get really quite painful so i'm just using the second the second line there if you want to use the determinant that's also fine our next one is going to be d by dz of f1 so that's xy minus d by dx of our z component And then finally, d by dx Okay, there's a non zero chance that I wrote it correctly. Yep. The second part with the J component. YZ, not YA. Okay. And then you just do your partials. Okay. But far more interesting than these computations, which you can finish up, I'll put the final answers in the um, solution, is what these things are really useful for. So remember, we're wanting to talk about rates of change. So the way to think about divergence, and the key is in kind of the name, is it talks about if you looked at your vector field and you imagine that, for example, um, our vector field is the velocity field of some fluid flow here, because it's kind of helpful. And if you imagine that I'm looking at one little point over here, right at the center, all my vectors are pointing outwards. So that tells me that my fluid flow is essentially diverging from that point. Fluid is being created. So if you look at a point and you look at the divergence at a point and you've got things pointing outwards, it means the vector field is moving out from there. If there's no movement <coughs> outwards, then your divergence would be zero. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, if you think about in terms of fluid flow, it's, is stuff being created from the point you're looking at <coughs> is stuff moving outwards or perhaps maybe stuff is being sucked towards it so maybe your divergence all points towards a point then things are moving in towards that point uh, so the divergence of a vector field measures the rate of the outward flow outward from a point so in a 2d field over here if we look at the point right at the center there everything is moving towards it so nothing's moving outwards everything's moving inwards our divergence would be negative 
because divergence, positive divergence means you're moving out, negative divergence means you're moving in towards a point. So that gives us a sense of kind of an, an outward expansion or an inward of pointing of a vector field. And you can use this, so this gets used in, for example, fluid mechanics. If you look at the velocity field outward across a boundary surface and you've got stuff net, if the net effect is that you've got stuff moving out, it means stuff must be being created inside. Um, similarly, if overall, if you look at a boundary surface and you, every, overall the divergence is negative, it means stuff is being annihilated inside or disappearing inside. Okay, so depending on which areas of physics you go into, there will be different interpretations for what it is that your divergence is doing, but that's the kind of change that it's modeling for us. Is stuff moving out or moving in? Okay, what about the curl? Well, again, thinking about a, 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 velo a velocity field for a fluid, we can think about the curl of saying, is our fluid curling, is it tw swirling or not? So is there some kind of movement? Um, if you think about like water going down a plug hole, there's a clear movement around the, dough, the plug hole. We want to be able to encapsulate that and that's sort of what the curl does. So let me just head to um, so if you have a look at, so I'm moving here you get a sense that there is movement within my vector field around the axis. Uh, so I would recommend Map Insight as an exceptionally good website to help you with vector calculus. There are a lot of useful things around the idea of various of the concepts that we've dealt with, and they have some very nice applets. And the way you can kind of visualize it again, if you imagine that we're looking at a, a ball centered over here, in this fluid flow, what would happen to that ball? Well, it would spin. So our curl, if you, because we've got a non-negative curl, it gives you an idea that um, there is a spin within the vector field. Oops. So how do we define the curl? Um, because our curl is a vector, so our diverg divergence, if we go back to these things over here. Okay, our divergence, if you have a look over there, is just a number. Um, it's basically, if it's positive, then you've got stuff moving out. If it's negative, you've got stuff moving in. And the volume, I mean, the, the size of the number tells you about how much in, in a very rough sort of way. But our curl is a vector. So we want to know if my vector is pointing in that direction, does it say I'm swirling this way or I'm swirling that way? And the way we define that is again with a right-hand rule. So the bit that we're interested in over here, if the curl of F points along the axis of rotation, um, we set the direction using the right-hand rule. So again, curl your, fi your fingers in the direction that the sphere is rotating, or equivalently that the vectors are pointing, and your thumb will point in the direction of the curl. So again, it's a right-hand rule. Uh, so the green arrow, so, so this is kind of pointing out. We've got our vector field doing this, and so the green arrow shows where our curl is. So the curl is always kind of pointing in a perpendicular direction to where your vectors are swirling. If that makes sense. Yeah, okay. So we have a bunch of identities. These are the ones we've just talked about. Grad, div, and curl. So today we introduced div and curl. Don't worry about the Laplacian operator, but you will definitely encounter it in physics if you haven't already. Um, Okay, so we have a, which is essentially our second derivative. It's kind of a second derivative. In the terms of a scalar field, it's just um, our gradient dotted with itself. For a vector field, uh, it looks like that. 
and we have a bunch of identities which you don't need to know except that some of them are quite interesting so the first bunch are really just telling you how the various operations distribute so for example if you've got a product of two scalar fields and you take their gradient what happens well it looks very much like a product rule that you've seen before so I'm looking at this over here that's the kind of product rule that you would expect so so that's great okay um, and in fact for all three of these these are really kind of examples of product rules <laughs> okay and in fact we have things get a little bit weird over here and here and here where we're combining vector so up to here, the first three, we only have one vector field and things look kind of normal. Two vector fields and things get a little bit hairy. Honestly, you don't need to know these, except that occasionally out in your physics life, it might be useful for simplifying things, maybe. Um, but the things that are, are particularly interesting over here are G and H. So what do these say? Well, this one here, says that if you find the curl of a vector field, it always has zero divergence. So this says that a curl has no divergence. So the curl is always going around like this. It's never kind of, once you've taken the curl, you don't have an outward, comp an outward moving component of a curl. And this thing over here, well, this is the gradient of a scalar field, which we know is a conservative vector field. So what this is telling us is that the curl of a conservative vector field is always equal to zero. So those are two useful things, and they're summarized over here. So the curl of any vector field is solenoidal, which says it doesn't, um, it doesn't have any divergence. Um, sorry, whoops, up here, sorry. Every conservative vector field is irrotational, so it doesn't have any curl, and this says that any vector field, if it's curl, has no divergence. Okay. All right. So, uh, So we're going to look at two theorems. Mm, yeah, I think just two theorems that basically give us a way of simplifying. So these are our, our kind of equivalents to the fundamental theorem of calculus that might make life easier. In particular, if we look at Green's theorem, so it's looking at a two-dimensional vector field. So a vector field that just has <coughs> X and Y components and it should have a J there, over a bounded region R with a boundary of a closed curve. So we're thinking about some two-dimensional vector field in a region that is bounded. And what does it tell us? Well, remember we were calculating these things and it was quite a pain. It was a line integral and involved a bunch of stuff. But Green's integral, Green's theorem, tells us that in fact we could redo this by doing a surface integral of the curl of f dotted with k, whatever that means. <coughs> An alternative version that you will sometimes see is that you can convert a line integral like this into a surface integral like this, or vice versa. So the whole point of this is it gives you a way of moving between integrals to hopefully find one that is not too horrific to calculate. Hmm? Okay. Let's look at the intuition behind Green's theorem. Okay, so just looking at it over here, it's curl integrated over the whole region versus the function itself integrated around the curve. Well, 
if we th we've got an R oriented closed curve, and if we look at this part of Green's theorem, so the integral of this around that curve, it's really kind of looking at the overall behavior of f just around that curve. So if you were thinking about this as integrating, for example, water movement, you'd just be looking at the macroscopic behavior of the water around the, surf around the boundary of the surface. That's kind of what you're doing when you're integrating there. So do you have, I don't know, a net swirl around there, net movement out, something like that. On the other hand, our curl of a vector field is talking about at a point, what is your function doing? Is it swirling like this or like that, things like that. <coughs> so really what we're doing when we integrate over the surface to get the other side, so we've got, we've got the curl side over there, when we're integrating over the surface, we're, we're kind of summing up all these tiny little microscopic curling behaviors of our fluid across the surface. And so what Green's theorem is really telling us is that the two ways are equivalent. You can either just look for, for the right kind of vector field that we've got. You can either just look around the boundary of the surface and take the macroscopic behavior and integrate that. Or you can look at microscopically what I'm doing in the kind of curling way and add that up over the surface, over the whole surface, and those two things are the same. Not sure if that's useful, but that is the intuition. So basically, line integral is the same as surface integral of curl. So there's some fine print over here, which again is just talking about our orientation. Um, you don't need to worry too much about that. Um, let's have a look and see how Green's theorem can make our lives better. Okay, so let's draw a sketch here. So we want to do that integral over there, whatever that means, and our boundary is this thing here. So there's an A, there's an A, and this is our region over here. And we want the positively oriented boundary of this quarter disk. So to be positively oriented, we need to move um, around it, keeping the boundary on our left. So to do that, our orientation would be like so. And what we'd like to do is convert that integral, where who the hell knows what that means, into something that we could actually integrate. So our Green's theorem, remember, says that, so let's see which form we should use. So because it's in this form, <coughs> so Green's theorem gives us a way of converting that bunny up there into this thing over here. So based on this, our F1 is this bit over here. Our F2 will be this bit over here. And so we can convert our integral into our integral over the region of, now we need the partial derivative of this component with respect to x, so that's just going to be 3x squared, and then we need to subtract off partial of the first component, 
partial uh, derivative with respect to y, which is going to give us 3y squared. And we need to do that over dA. So we've gone from some hairy thing that we didn't really understand before to an integral that you can totally do. Um, because you know what your region is, you're good to go. So switch to polar because we've got a, a chunk of a circle. And if you finish up the work, Yep. So the way you define the bounds at which you do this double integral, um, so for the iterations and such, it heavily depends on how you choose the positively the positive orientation, right? That's why you draw the green arrows. Yep. Okay. Yep. Plus. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I'm just going to have to let that charge a little bit more. Okay, so there should be a plus here. Okay. So I will do another example for you in the final notes. It's it's a pretty straightforward one. Um, these these examples are not super helpful because it's in in the context of this course because it's not clear to to you why you would get that line integral. Um, but if you're using this in physics, you will often encounter th situations where you end up with something that looks like that, that you don't want to have to deal with because who the hell knows how to do that, but you can convert it into a surface integral that you can do pretty straightforwardly. Um, so think of these as kind of examples to keep in your head for when you see something like that out in the physics world, Green's theorem is going to make your life better. Okay. So, on to the next theorem. So what does Stokes' theorem do? So remember, Green's theorem has just talked about we're just looking at a vector field on a plane. Uh, so essentially, when we're talking about Green's theorem, we're just looking on the xy plane. We've got some vector field on that xy plane. Everything's happening in the plane. Stokes' theorem says, well, we don't always want to work on the plane. <coughs> So we're going to generalize to the same idea. Suppose instead now I have a surface that is not <coughs> just a plane, some moving surface, and I'm again looking at what happens. I'm comparing the curl of sort of the curl within the surface to what happens around the boundary of the surface. So it's kind of exactly the same thing, except now our surface can be curved. And what does it say? Well, it looks quite similar. Um, so now we're allowed to have uh, a piecewise smooth oriented surface. So before we just had a region in the xy plane, but now it can be any surface. But we have something that looks quite similar to greens, except that our curl is going to be dotted with the normal of the surface. So we didn't have to worry about that when we were in the xy plane, but now we're having to think about how our curl orients with respect to the surface, and that's what's happening when we have our normal over here. Um, but essentially, we've got basically the same thing happening that we had before. So the, the intuition is very similar. OK, so let's just look at an example. not the example that I wanted to do. Okay. Mm. So I think what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to record a YouTube video of me talking through this example just so that I don't rush through it. Um, I'm going to give you the intuition for the final theorem, and I'll record an, a YouTube video of the example for that. 
and then we can just run through what we've covered in the class today as a kind of overall, because I know that we've done a lot. Okay, so the two theorems that we just looked at, Stokes' theorem and Green's theorem, both looked at what happens to the curl. Either you look at curl integrating it over a <coughs> surface, or you look at the vector field um, going around the boundary of the surface. But you might ask, well, okay, are there any theorems that have to do with how the divergence behaves? And the answer is absolutely yes. And that's Gauss, good old Gauss. He has Gauss's theorem. And this tells us how you can look at the divergence of, so there's actually, there's, <laughs> there's the two-dimensional thing, which says what happens to the divergence in a region. Well, it looks a lot like a surface integral. I mean, it looks like a line integral around a closed surface. Um, and you can have the three-dimensional version, which is called Gauss's theorem, which says that if you look at the divergence over a volume, so how much the net, like net um, part of your vector field is, is kind of diverging out of that, is there some way that you can compare that to just looking on the boundary? Yes, there is. If you look at how much of your vector field points out of the normal of the boundary, and you integrate over the surface of the boundary, it's going to give you the same thing. So again, it's a kind of an internal, so looking at a volume and what's happening within that volume and summing up over that volume of your divergence, or just looking on the surface overall and seeing the kind of macroscopic pro um, properties of your vector field, how much of it is pointing out from your surface and summing that up over the surface. It looks like the Gauss theorem is super used in electromagnetism or more the Gauss theorem like fundamental in electromagnetism or something like that, because I think I heard about it in electromagnetic quantum. So my, my electromagnetism is very hazy, but quite likely. Okay. But I would go and check it. But this is the same Gauss. It's the same Gauss? It's the same Gauss. Okay, so maybe I'll do different. Uh... But he also, I mean, Gauss, Gauss was really annoying. He just did so much stuff. Like, <laughs> um, so I would, I would double check. Um, yep. It is the same, yeah. Yep, is it? Yep, okay. And so the net result of that is that you can use, again, surface integrals like this, which are a bit hairy, become much nicer when you can convert them. So one minute, please. I realize we've done a huge amount today. But we kind of needed to just do the last little bit because it is in some it's it's the punchline of the course is the the theorems that we just did are the theorems that you need for physics, um, and the only way we could get to those theorems was the previous five and a half weeks. <laughs> okay, so what did we do? We talked about surfaces and surface integrals. They look hairy, but really it's it's a lot like doing line integrals. It's just two dimensions. Okay. Then we talked a little bit about oriented surfaces because we need to have often be, we need to be able to define a way up or out of a surface. And then we introduced two new ways of looking at the rates of change of vector functions. So we had the gradient tells us about the rate of change of a scalar function, a scalar vector field, a scalar field. In order to talk about rates of change of vector fields, we need divergence and curl. We looked at some identities and discovered some stuff about conservative vector fields. And then we did our three important theorems of which Green's and Stokes are kind of the most uh, common, which gives us ways of converting between essentially surface integrals and volume integrals um, or things like that. Okay. Well done. Um, I will put the two little videos up probably later today or tomorrow. Or possibly I have them from last year. And we're pretty much good to go. So there'll be examples of all of this in the tutorials this week. I will put the online quiz now that we've finished. Any questions, comments, queries, concerns? I, I was saying to my husband, I feel like 
basically when I teach this course, it's like I'm turning you into those foie gras ducks where they just keep like stuffing more and more stuff inside the ducks to turn so you can make foie gras. And that's a little how I feel and I'm sorry, but I've, I've, I've done the minimum that I could. Um, so, um, but yeah, spend some time, do the examples. It will all be fine. All right.